Hello everybody. Well, I have a pretty good show for you guys today. Today we are going to be making a hammer from scratch. Now the great thing about this is, is the, how did I come up with this video? Well, I had somebody order a hammer and I was out of them, so my apologies to my customer, uh, but your, your hammer is going to be on film. So we started originally making these hammers out of forklift tines, which is 4140. We'd actually go get a forklift tine from the scrap yard, but cutting that thing into usable sections was just a pain in the hind end. So the last batch we did, we actually bought some inch and a quarter, I think inch and a quarter uh, square stock that was 1075, which was comparable to the 4140. But starting off, we basically have these hammer blanks. They're about two pounds. And of course, the first thing that you've got to do is actually uh, open them up to punch the slot. Now, I will tell you something. Uh, there's a lot of blacksmiths that do this far better than I do. But this is just what has turned out to work well for me. So uh, instead of using a punch, that's actually a chisel. It's actually got a sharp face. Uh, every time that I use a flat face punch for this, uh, what ends up happening inevitably is that the punch actually slides a little bit inside of the hammer and I just it never punches straight. So when I started using this particular slit, uh, it just it just worked out so much better. It's also a very steep angle on the slit uh, or the slitter, which makes uh, it easy to extract. And what you're seeing me do is once I get started, I actually take a little piece of coal pop it down in there and that coal uh, acts as a lubricant it helps me get that piece out now, now if you saw that right there when I pull that slit out there was like a perfect form of coal and it looked like that the front end of my slitter had actually broken off I, my butt puckered a little bit right there so but there's one side punched uh, or, or slit rather and what I'll do now is I'll go back into the fire and go into the other side and like this one turned out really super well. Sometimes it's a little bit off and I end up having to punch a plug out of it anyway. Uh, but this one like went surprisingly well. Now I'm going very slow. I'm taking my time. I'm not really putting a lot of heavy blows on this. But I mean, this is comparable to actually, oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. That was very pretty. So now, here's one other thing that I do. I don't know if this is the right way or not, but it works for me. So what this is, is this is a short drift. And this allows me to go ahead and open that hole up to fit my hand drift. So I've got a piece set in there, a, a hardy tool there that gives me a little bit of height. And you just basically put this little plug in there. Uh, it's just kind of a pain in the butt sometimes to get out. But once it comes out one side, I do it from one side, then I do it from the other side. And it really does an amazingly good job. Uh, the piece is actually made out of H13, so it's pretty resilient. And sometimes, uh, unfortunately, it sticks in the hardy hole. But you can see that's a, that's a pretty nice place to start from. So now what I'll do is I'll actually take my hand drift. And this is where you start working down the cheeks drift goes in, it's seated, it's snugged up, and a lot of the times when you're doing this work, when, when you think of a drift, and that's the thing that I'm using, it's not, it, it's not a stretching tool for the most part. It acts as an internal anvil. So even though I'm kind of bumping it down, keeping it taut, making sure there's no gaps, the drift is really a type of anvil that allows you to hammer this piece uh, and to bring the cheeks in. Now again, you see on the power hammer uh, that there's a combination die, that there's a rounded side and a flat side, and that's, in, a, in an operation like this, that's where this thing really shines, because I can go over here to the rounded side, draw those cheeks, and then slide back over to the flat side to keep everything nice, straight, and, and neat. Little tippy tap there, and it comes right off. Now I'm gonna tell you, if you start drifting, uh, be prepared for things to stick, and you're going to cuss a lot. So one of the aggravations in my shop is that I only have a Sahindler. Uh, I only have one power hammer. I really need a mechanical hammer or a tire hammer because when I'm making hammers like this, I have to swap dies. And again, it's not 
it's not insurmountable, but it is a pain in the hind end. When you start getting into production work, you don't want to have to change dies. You just want to go to the machine that's already set up. But I don't have a tire hammer yet, and uh, so this is what we have to do. Changing dies is just part of production work. So I'm going to fight with it a little bit. Oh, is there enough wedges? Nope. Got to put some more wedges in there and try to do this like a professional. And uh, yeah, that, that, really, that really happens. So... It's just a, a stack of wedges. I couldn't find the wedge that I wanted, so I just had to get like a, a wad of shims and cram it in there. I don't need it for much. Just I just got to make it work. So this is how I line it up. I'll actually bring them down, make sure everything's seated, make sure it's lined up. I'll throw the wedge in. But on these hammers, you'll, you'll notice I'll actually start this. I won't really drive it until that cylinder is all the way up. Because if you hammer it while it's down like that, it puts a lot of wear, a lot of stress on the cylinder. However, if it's up like that, you're good to go. So smacky, smacky, smacky. And now those particular radiuses uh, do a really good job of making the face of the hammer. And in this case, you really need those thin dies, those fullering dies, to actually pull out the cross pin. I have tried to do a cross pinging on a slug of this size with the big radius, the, the actual combo dies, and it just looks like poor, uh, pure poo-poo. It's just terrible. Um, but again, with these dies, you have to go uh, very slow. This is where hand work has a tremendous advantage over a power hammer in that you go slow and there's actually a little bit of there's actually a little bit bigger range of, of what you can do when you're working it by hand, even though there's a tremendous more, uh, a much larger input of energy and, you know, and effort. Now, I've got to give credit to YouTube for this. Now, if you'll notice, if you look close, you can see that the end of that piece is fish mouth. When I first started hammers, I did everything in the world to try to avoid that. And it, you, you don't. You, you hammer the fish mouth in. And you either just cut it off, just cut it right off the end of it, or you grind it out. And I have to give credit to YouTube for that. I've, I've been fascinated by watching some of the videos from India uh, that show a lot of these processes. Um, and the guy was making hammers. And I saw this giant fish mouth on his hammer. I'm like, well, you know, boy, he's just screwed it up. And then he actually had a die set up, a butchering tool, and he just clipped it off. And I'm like, damn. I've been doing it wrong. So now we just draw it out. And uh, now the one thing I do in the shop is I'll take a, a full heat like this. I'll make sure and get a good hold on it. And the way that I remove a lot of this stuff, I actually just take this to my 2x72 grinder. Now here's the thing. Back in the day, a tremendous amount of work was done on these huge grinding wheels. So even though I'm using the modern 2 by 72 inch, it's pretty historical. So much of the blacksmith's work would have had, I mean, you would have had these large grinding wheels like everywhere in these shops because if they were making swords or anything like that, they had people that that's all they did. So, so I've run the drift back through here just to kind of clean everything up. And at some point here, I should be going to the grinder. Unless I'm just a complete liar. I'm going to think about it. Your OCD starts freaking out when you watch these videos. I can see that's just a little bit off. So again, what I'm doing here is I've, uh, I've got a little cradle right there that keeps the cheeks from deforming. And I'm, I'm basically just cleaning up. Uh, I'm cleaning up that hammer hole uh, where it got distorted when I was doing the front and the back. So we're going to clean this up. And this is the one port where the, the drift is, is acting as a, as a stretching device. It's not so much an anvil, but it's actually stretching up, making, stretching that hole out, making sure that it's, you know, it's of uniform shape. And the drift also allows you... Now, here's the thing. If you've ever made a hammer, it's so easy to get the back end of it twisted, not in line with the handle. And the drift is actually how you can get enough hold on it to actually straighten it up. All right, finally, here we are at the grinder. So if you've ever done blacksmithing, uh, you know that you can use an old hoof rasp to do what we call hot rasping. And so this is kind of the, 
turbo version of, of hot rasping. Uh, that 2 by 72 inch belt, that's one of those ceramic high-end blaze belts. Uh, we use that for a lot of our knife grinding. This is an older one. Does a great job. I mean, I'm, I'm hogging probably a half inch of material off of this piece. Now, the footage is sped up a little bit, but you certainly get an idea for just how much material is coming off. You can do this cold, but it's just nowhere near as quick or as effective. So, and of course, if you're if you're doing something to make money, uh, time is money. The faster you can do it, the more aggressive you can be, the better off you're going to be. That's one thing I always chuckled at with the, the hobbyists, you know, where people are in the backyard. Um, you know, there's a lot of people say, you know, doing it by hand and doing it the old way is always the best way. <laughs> nah, no, not really. Not really. Uh, these tools were designed by blacksmiths for a reason. Uh, so, yeah. So we're going to, basically what I've done there is I've ground out that fish mouth. I've gotten the basic rounding and I've cleaned the face up and got it flat and square. So now the only thing that really needs to happen is the drift needs to go back in. And I believe I need to stamp this bad boy. I had a apprentice a couple months ago and lost one of my stamps. I'm still looking for the proper stamp. But uh, I actually had to double stamp this and I got a little bit off so I had to come back in. Oh yeah, we got any of the footage. I was hoping my guy was not going to show, show me screwing up that bad. But there's the double stamp. It is now officially a Trent Tie product. Now what needs to happen is this needs to come up to, uh, we actually need to temper it. And that is a bucket of canola oil. And what I'm doing, it was a pretty cool day when we were doing this. That oil needs to be about 120, 130 degrees. And I found that if I heat that one inch rod, drop it in there, stir it up a little bit, it brings it up a temperature pretty quick. And, uh, what I'm doing there is I've got a handy dandy infrared thermometer, checking my temperature. Of course, you have to stir it because all the hot oil will be on top. Going to set myself on fire. Don't worry about it. I'm a professional. Temperature's good. So now that thermometer that I have actually is a very high temperature one. So I actually shoot the hammer in the forge. When I am actually hardening these, um, I'm able to read the temperature on that hammer very accurately with the thermometer. And so this makes everything go quickly. Now, if you were doing this in a super production setting, you would have those hammers in a digital oven um, on that end of it. And for what I'm doing with these hammers, just, just not necessary. Now, however, the tempering of this, uh, you do want to be very accurate with that. And so... What we'll do to temper this is we'll actually take this bad boy out. Uh, it will go in my modified Paragon oven in the back. And it will cook uh, for about an hour and then dropped in water to be tempered. But that's what it looks like right there. All right, guys. Thank you all for watching. I will catch you folks a little bit later on part two. Hope you guys are enjoying the new videos. Y'all be good.